please run up. We've heard nothing from Mr. Haig overnight, as well to confirm that. Um, can I begin this morning by handing up some documents? Yeah. Firstly, the witness statement of Miss Cook, with its exhibits that was promised to your honour yesterday. Yeah. Which relates to service of documents on Mr. Haig. Thank you very much. May I just glance at that? Certainly. Yes, well, I haven't absorbed all of that. No, of course. Um, it, it appears to be yes. comprehensive in covering the position over the last uh, month and earlier. Yes, so we thought it best to address service since Your Honour's directions. I'm very grateful, thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you too. Uh, and Your Honour will have seen. Thank for working so hard on it overnight. Absolutely, and Your Honour will have seen it with collated proofs of delivery where possible. Yes. So where documents have been couriered. Yes. The yes, thank you very much. The second is a small group of documents which consist of a draft order, a speaking note, uh, a, yes, a speaking note, and um, a case called Murad and Al Sarat, which I'll address you on on very briefly. It's, uh, I'm not sure I will need to go to it in any detail. I can pass those up. Thank you. And in, we have prepared an updated chronology, uh, but Ms. Cook, in fact, noticed a typo in it. Uh, <laughs> we'll correct that during the course of the morning and get it to. Thank you very much. So if I can pass these three up. begin with the draft order, yes. what it is we seek, where we're going. Um, the second page is the substantive part of the order. We can review its form at the end of it arises. Mm. Uh, we seek judgment in the amounts of 8.7 million dirhams odd, $50,000 and a little over 2 million pounds, uh, plus simple interest from the 28th of May. 2014, yeah. which is the date of issue of the claim. Say it's having to work out each individual payment, uh, line, by, line by line, spending a great deal of time and therefore cost on mathematics. Yeah. Um, and also we submit does justice to Mr. does every possible justice to Mr. Haig. No. He cannot possibly be heard to complain about interest uh, up, uh, after the issue of the claim. Uh, uh, we are informed by the court last year, in, in 2016, when we obtained summary judgment, uh, that this court awards uh, Ebor plus one percent. Whatever the current say. Uh, yes. I don't know why that might be. I suppose it's, because it's as good a, an interest rate as any. Well, it's a slight oddity. It is. Uh, uh, if that is. And in the ordinary way, one would look for the uh, currency of loss. 
and uh, the borrowing rate in that particular currency. But yes, that, that's certainly... given the interest rates that have prevailed generally. I'm not sure it makes a great it's, deal of difference in that's terms what I'm of percentage yeah, points. Yeah, in um, real terms, the, the difference is going to be yes. uh, minimal and uh, eyeball three months plus one percent is probably as good as any. Indeed, I think that may be why, and also because of the particular nature of this court and how many different currencies it <laughs> case in the old yeah, It happens all around the world. But, uh, so. um, certainly, yes, in England it is. But, but you want to see us there, we seek. Yes. Judgment in that sum. Uh, we seek a declaration that those sums were received by the defendant when he received them on constructive trust for the claimant. Uh, and that the defendant's counterclaim is dismissed. And then we seek costs and we seek them on the indemnity basis. I'll address you on if that arises. The, the only point that occurs to me in relation to subparagraph 2 yes. is the sum that was the sums that were received by into Mr. Utiana's accounts. Yes. Uh, obviously, the first one did not come back directly to no. Mr. Haig's account. The other two did in very large measure. Yes. But left small sums to Mr. Utiana. Uh, how do you? submit I sh should deal with those. Uh, perhaps I was a little broad, too broad with paragraph two. Uh, one could say when received by the defendant or for his benefit. Or to his order. Or to what, um, what form of words would you suggest? Because it's, it, plainly you intend to come and if your submission says it's as to the principles, it ought to cover anything that, um, you know, if he directed it uh, to a close family member or whatever, it yes. would be to his order and he would still be accountable, would he not? Oh, absolutely. I'm just thinking uh, of whether it would be better to his order or for his benefit as a matter of well, do you trust want to, law, but I'll think about that. Do you want to come back on that? Yes. But, um, kind of. It appears to me that. The wording needs to be different if it is truly to cover all the sums in question yes. that have been paid out uh, yes. by fraudulent means as alleged. Yes. Uh, as a matter of practice, whether it's worth pursuing Mr. Richie Arnold for £57,000. No, I understand you know, that. But, but that's, that's a different, different matter. That's a different point in time. But so far as the defendant himself is concerned, absolutely. Um, the, uh, the order ought to properly express yes. uh, the way in which the sums are dealt with. Yes. And I should say, as a matter of housekeeping, uh, we are filing Ms. Cook's witness statement this morning. Uh, we are filing my closing note so that it is, it is in the court system. We're sending both to Mr. Haig. We've already sent this cook's witness statement to Mr. Haig. And so he knows about the events. If he's yeah. choosing not to watch them on the uh, live feed. And with that, I may I will address your honour in closing. And your honour will be no doubt pleased to hear that I will be a fraction of the time in closing that I was in opening. Yes. Uh, I don't propose to go back through the evidence which your honour has read and to which I have referred your honour and your honour has referred the course of Mr Patel's evidence. Uh, it, it's pretty clear to anyone what are the witness statements and affidavits which are before the court and what they say are. Uh, on one view, it is tempting to say, well, Mr. Patel came up to prove, and there's an end of it. Uh, but I shall address your honour in more detail. Uh, I've reduced what I intend to say to a bit skeleton form to a closing note, which I hope will be of assistance in due course. Thank you. So, you're right. so the first thing we. The, the out, only other thing I had asked for, I don't know whether this reached you or not, yes. was for a copy of your skeleton 
argument in word format. Ah, it hasn't, but it takes a, it, it is a work of moments. Thank you. And, and again, it might be useful if I had this the closing, note in, word closing note in word format uh, yes. also, if you wouldn't mind. Not at all. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, that is being taken care of. Thank you very much. Um, it wonders in modern technology these things can be done via port while I'm talking. Uh, Indeed. Indeed. Uh, as long as you've got the right software. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Your Honour, the first thing we can say, Mr Haig has engaged with this trial solely in order to delay or frustrate it. And uh, we submit that the court, it's not just a question of the court proceeding. Your Honour can draw an adverse inference against Mr Haig from the way he, he has behaved. Those who are victims in the way that Mr. Haig claims to be don't act like this. We submit that the issues, there are eight, fall for determination, although they can be resolved relatively quickly. Firstly, have we proved that Mr. Haig's bank accounts received the substantial sums of money paid by us? Second, have we proved that at the time of such receipt he was our fiduciary? Third, has Mr. Haig put forward any credible evidence and legitimate explanation for his receipt of such funds? And that's important because, of course, if he was a fiduciary, the burden is actually on him to justify that receipt. Uh, has, uh, have we proved that the payments into Mr. Haig's bank accounts were accounted for in our records by fraudulent audit trail? Uh, we prove that that audit trial was either caused, uh, created or uh, procured by Mr. Haig. There is an issue raised by Your Honour as to whether Mr. Haig is entitled to a credit of 757,000 dirhams. We say no. Uh, the seventh issue is, are the general allegations made by Mr. Haig about GFH and his parent evidenced, relevant or even credible? And finally, has Mr. Haig established any part of his counterclaim? And we say no, not least because he's not here to prosecute. He's chosen to have sentence. On Sunday, we undertook a laborious exercise in analysing the banking evidence uh, and the documents recovered from GFH's records, as well as the emails. We went through some of that exercise again with Mr. Patel, and he adopted the schedules which we prepared in evidence, uh, give or take the indication of human error. And Your Honour indicated that you have been through the schedules too. You would just hope, I think, for uh, to clarify mine. And if you could very briefly run through the three or four different methods that we used to. Yes. So we have on the one hand uh, the simple uh, instructions given to solicitors. Yes. In some cases, with supporting invoices which they required, yes. particularly in the case of GPW, but even then, didn't always get them. Yes. In the Milnet case, without yes. any supporting invoices at all. Yes. So that's one stroke two means of operation, either with or without invoices, but emails to solicitors pay out of the client account yes. these funds to these suppliers. Uh, then you have uh, instructions sent by email from Mr. Haig to Mr. Matthew. Yes. And I just want to be clear as to uh, what those instructions were in the context of one payment or two creation of invoices yes. or three creation of the funding transfer forms yes. about which on some of its points there's limited evidence but inferences may fall to be drawn. Yes. 
uh, and then others where there is no direct communication that we can see from yes. Mr. Haig to Mr. Bijou Matthew, but the end result is creation of false invoice uh, with funding transfer forms uh, with signat signatures either original or facsimile of Mr Haig and Mr Matthew. Yes. Have, I, have I missed any no. any modus? No. And uh, your Honour will recall the evidence relating to Gibson Dunn's client account comes from uh, Mr. Rocher, yes. in the first instance. Uh, there were emails between Mr. Haig's email box and Mr. Plumtree. Mr. Haig puts an issue whether that was Mr. Haig communicating. Yeah. Uh, we say well, there is simply no evidence. I'm coming, I was coming to this, but we say there's simply no evidence of Mr. Haig having been. Uh, ha having had his email account hacked, as it were. Yes. Uh, but yes, Your Honour's quite right. As regards Milnet, Mr. Haig simply said, please pay these. And, and there's a, a reference in one of the emails from Mr. Plumtree saying that the Accounts Department appears to have been prepared to proceed on Milnet uh, in payments the, yes. on Mr. Haig's say so yes. without invoices. But the ordinary position was that they required production of invoices before making any payment. But even then, there's one that isn't ultimately produced, I think, despite the request for it. You missed the sequence of events. Yes, Mr. Haig emailed, and the payments were made as regards Milnet without supporting invoices. Yes. There was, Milnet was also the supplier with respect to whom uh, there was an email exchange where Mr. where Milnet sent an invoice to both Gibson Dunn and Mr. Haig Yes, simultaneously. You said that you sent it to me. And he, yeah, and he said, please send these only to me. Yeah. Um, Mr. Plumtree then sent an email, you will recall, oh, when Mr. Haig raised queries about GPW, why he needed invoice. Mr. Plumtree said, I believe it might be because Philip and Peter were in were the office. Were both in the office at the time. Implication being that they were prepared to authorise Kant to pay, yes. even without an invoice. Yes. I mean, yes. that's the obvious implication of inference to draw, yes. isn't it? And an, an inference might be that that was a, a particular example of a breach of trust by Mr. Haig. Yes. Because without those two senior members of the firm in the office, he had to uh, produce some sort of supporting paperwork if he wanted Gibson Dunn to pay. But yes, that was the second modus operandi where an invoice would be forthcoming or some form of paperwork. Now, let's just explore that for a yes. moment uh, as a matter of inference or conclusion that you say the court should draw or may or may not need to draw. Yes. Um, if we're talking about the second half of 2013, which for the most part we are in relation to the whole sequence. Yes. Um, we have, apparently, Mr. Haig in the UK. Yes. And hardly ever, though occasionally, he yes. makes a guest appearance in Dubai. Yes. Is that right? Well, Mr. Patel's evidence was he believed that Mr. Haig didn't set foot in Dubai in the second half of 2013. Yes. He was very candid about that, of course. That's what he thought. Yes. Now, I mean, it's almost certain that Mr. Haig would have come to Dubai at some stage. Yes, exactly. exactly. So, I mean, the way I put it, I think is I think that's correct. Probably... The evidence would suggest that he essentially was living in the UK with occasional visits to Dubai I at the most. That must be that must be the same thing. Yes. So, when it comes to the question of who is actually concocting the invoices, yes, we have. And I can't remember the number of occasions, but we have emails from Mr. Haig in which he says, in terms, if necessary, split pay, and he gives a figure and an account, mm -hmm. uh, and a supposed supplier, GPW or David Murray, or whatever it may be, and says, please split and pay. 
be split if necessary. Yeah. Okay. And what is your submission as to what I should find as to what then happens from that point on? Um, I'm, as, I'm about to submit to you, Anna, that so far as the method of transfer of funds is concerned, what is important is the payment instructions, because they're the ones that cause the bank to actually transfer the money. Yes. And Your Honour has referred to an email from Mr. Haig to Mr. Matthew, space, saying please pay these today and split if necessary. The implication we invite the court to draw was that Mr. Haig was well aware of the upper limit of his signing authority and Mr. Matthew's signing authority. Yes. And, and I must infer Mr. Matthew too. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And so far as, but so far as Mr. Matthew is concerned, Your Honour will recall Mr. Patel's careful assessment of Mr. Matthew. Yes. And that he, as Your Honour put it to him, stupid not rather than dishonest, that yes. he was put on probation and that he was a junior employee who essentially found himself in a position that he really shouldn't have been put in. Yes, dominated and did what he was told. Yes. Understood. Um, but but so I'm, I'm thinking in practical terms in relation to the uh, other evidence that uh, yes. Mr. Haig uh, adduced in the form of statements in the early point. I mean, who is cutting and pasting? Uh, who is creating the yes. uh, relevant uh, invoice? Um, well, and th there is evidence that Mr. Hay, that, that Mr. Hay's friends witnessed the creation of invoices by an Indian gentleman who yes. must have by inference been Mr. Matthew. Indeed. Um, we say it doesn't matter because mm -hmm. one of the issues for determination is whether the fraudulent audit trial was either created or procured by Indeed. Mr. Hay. So, in one, so, so far as the uh, route to judgment is concerned, it, it doesn't really matter which way. We do not accept on their face the truth of Mr. Hay's witness statements or Understood. those of his friends. But there are only Mr. two candidates, aren't there? Well, Mr. Patel gave evidence to Your Honour that he, the Desiree Edwards, had access to Mr. Hay's electronic signature and that there was a practice of documents being uh, having his signature appended to them electronically in his absence. There is something curious about the deputy CEO of an office working from the United Kingdom. There were, <laughs> there were other instances, Mr. Patel said, where documents were couriered to Mr. Haig yes. for his signature. Uh, Finally, um, there, are, there is one email where Mr. Haig says, sort these out, I'll take care of the invoices when I'm next in the office. Don't mind that. I'll find the reference. But uh, the, the, the point being, um, Mr. Sinclair says that the uh, Lincoln Associates invoices were sent in word format. So, <laughs> uh, so, it isn't necessarily the case, modern technology being what it is, that somebody had to sit in a room somewhere with Lincoln Associates, GPW, the yeah. Fountain Court uh, logos and start putting together a document. It could simply be a question of it being done electronically. I understood. Now, whether, whether that's the case or not, we don't know. And we well, in one sense, I understand it doesn't matter. Yes. But in another, um, one always likes to find facts. Oh, absolutely. Where it's um, clear, the evidence is sufficiently clear. Uh, and as I understood the evidence, both the electronic signature and the stamp oh, yeah. were in the PA's possession. Yes. Yes. Uh, not actually uh, Mr. Matthews' yes. possession. Yes. And Your Honour will recall those letters of instruction to GPW, which were in fact genuine instructions, 
where somebody, we say Mr. Haig, has written fake Desiree on Mr. Haig, next to Mr. Haig's signature. So within the office, the candidates for the creation of false invoices yes. are Mr. Haig, Mr. Matthew, and or Desiree Edwards in some combination. Yes, well, we well, say, I, I see that entirely, but in circumstances where Mr. Haig is in care, yes. and email instructions in particular are going, yes. which talk about splitting invoices, uh, <coughs> the conclusion must be reached that the concoction of invoices is taking place in Dubai by one or other of those two who remain. The creation of the documents themselves that were entered, entered into the claimant's records, uh, there is, well certainly those which bear Mr. Hayes' electronic signature must have been, or, or are, are likely to have been, through the office of Dubai at some point. Well, and this and is those that were sent to GPW, self evident because we can see on some of the exchanges of emails yes. that Mr. Matthew is sending yes. the 65,000 and 45,000 invoices, 43,000, whatever they are. Uh, the attached invoices for the needful. Now, I mean, part of the difficulty is we're dealing with the reason I'm pausing in a, on an issue which we say doesn't matter, and being careful in what I submit, particularly in light of the evidence of Mr. Patel that Mr. Matthew was stupid rather than dishonest and very pliant, and Ms. Edwards was part of a culture of fear and almost Mr. Hayes' deputy in the mm. office, mm. in possession of his electronic signature and his stamp, is we are dealing with a case that relates to um, fraudulent documents. And for example, Mr. Haig forwarding an email from Mr. Matthew saying, please find uh, attached invoices for your need for, uh, is uh, not necessarily evidence that the invoices subsequently forwarded to Mr. Plumtree by Mr. Haig were the invoices which were attached to Mr. Matthew's email in circumstances where Mr. Haig is in the United Kingdom and Mr. Matthew could well be sending any invoice that the deputy CEO needs to look at. Um, so, but, but it has a reference on the top, the email I'm thinking of particularly, which oh, yes. GPW. There's an invoice reference at the top, but the which team. only exists as far as you know in the concocted invoices. Oh, absolutely. That's the attachment. Yes. That's the, that's the attachment to Mr. Haig's email. The difficulty is that that attachment reference isn't on Mr. Matthew's email. Is it not? No. However, it is equally possible that those fraudulent invoices were the attachments. Yeah. And so on the question of what is more likely than not, when one is dealing with a situation where Mr. Matthew must have been party to the creation of false documents, because his signature is on all the payment instructions. Yes. It is difficult to say whether it is more likely than not that Mr. Matthew attached the bonus invoices to that email, or Mr. Haig found an email from Mr. Matthew, deleted the attachments which he did have, and attached his own invoices. Secondly, if they were the bonus invoices that were attached to Mr. Matthew's email, it is not necessarily the easiest thing in the world to know whether that was an invoice created by Mr. Matthew in the office or created by Mr. Haig and introduced in some other way. Because the other thing you don't know is precisely when the invoices were created. And Your Honour has remarked that there appear to be instances of Mr. Haig uh, or of invoices being created retrospectively to justify payments which have been either decided on or made. Yeah. Uh, and then the other instances where the invoices were introduced shortly before the payment was made. Now, none of this matters. What no, we no, say I follow, is, follow that. I, I, is an interjection. 
partly, I'm afraid, simply a matter of curiosity on my part. Yes. But you're, you're right in saying that the um, please do the needful from Mr. Matthew doesn't actually have a reference to the invoice numbers on it. It's only, and, only Mr. Yes. Hague's <coughs> email to Mr. Plumtree that has yes. uh, the attachments to the reference. Let me just look for the later invoice. Insofar as a fact-finding exercise on this point, there's only one email from Mr. Matthew. Yes, in the chain. Please find attached GPW outstanding invoices. Please do the needful. And there is something else curious yes. about this. Well, please do the needful. It's curious in itself. Okay. That, that is, but. Um, the implication, the ordinary implication of such an email, excuse me. In a uh, non-fraud situation. In a non-fraud situation would be a, an accounts officer, junior accounts officer, sending invoices that have yet to be paid to his CEO to say, please, can you do what needs to be done to get these paid? Now, the particular curiosity of Mr. Matthews sending those invoices to Mr. Haig in those terms on the 21st of August of 2013 was that Mr. Haig had asked Gibson Dunn to make those payments the previous day and been asked by Mr. Plumtree for the invoices. So uh, one would have to be finding that Mr. Matthew was part of the creation of a false email trail to give the impression. Uh, but it's also inconsistent with Mr. Haig having already asked for those payments. Mm. Then the email, uh, if he then sent a message to Mr. Matthew by one means or another saying, please can I have those invoices, the email that one might have expected is uh, invoices as requested. So uh, anything is possible, you know, what is probable? What is probable is that um, it was that, that the invoices, those particular invoices, were created at some point between the 20th and the 21st of August when Mr. Plumtree said, I'm sorry, we're going to need an invoice. Yes. Because you will recall on the 20th of August, Mr. Hague's response was, but we didn't need them for Milner. Yes. So, so that is probable. As to who precisely then created those documents, whether it be one, two, or three individuals, I am not sure the court will ever be in a position no. to reach a finding of fact on that, unless uh, Mr. Matthew and Mr. Ms. Edwards are summons and their evidence is such that the court feels able to rely on it. The two, two both would have to be present. Yes. As to whether it is necessary to find that fact, we say no for two reasons. Um, firstly, because the evidence of Mr. Patel was there is a there was a culture of fear in Mr. Hay, and that through her, him, Ms. Edwards dominated the office. So, if others were in fact doing things, it is almost inevitable they were doing so at Mr. Hay's ultimate direction. There is no evidence that Ms. Edwards went on a frolic of her own and procured the payment of millions to Mr. Hay. The second reason we say that your honour doesn't need to find exactly the basis because as I said in opening if there was also a conspiracy to harm the claimant that doesn't absolve Mr Hague of his life no, no, no. for breach of fiduciary duty and that is the claim uh, your honour is but your Honour's concern is understandable precisely how did this fraud take place is often well, is genuinely the starting point of any judgment on whether or not there is a liability. <coughs> In all fraud cases, yes. follow the money, it's the, the usual rumour. Absolutely. <laughs> Where does it finish up is a very good guide to what... <laughs> to who was liable, yes. <laughs> who was doing what. <laughs> so so, so that, that I fully understand. If it assists uh, your honour with the I'm, I'm, I'm interested really in this for, for only this reason. Yes. Where one's got express email instructions yes. from Mr. Haynes' email account, 
Yes. And I can see no basis for saying those don't emanate from Mr. Haig himself. Yes. As you say, no evidence lack of hacking. But where all you have is in fact no express evidence of an instruction going to Mr. Matthew or to the PA, the likelihood that at the relevant period Mr. Haig is actually in the UK. Yes. An invoice which on its face directs payment to Mr. Haig's account. Yes. Of one kind or another, depending on which supplier we're talking about. Uh, and his stamp on it. And a transfer request form to the bank that has Mr. Matthews, I take it original signature in every case, but I'm not sure the evidence shows that. But we haven't taken a point of Mr. Matthews' signature, have we been? Sure. Okay. Uh, and on, in addition, Mr. Hayes, either original signature, or more commonly, I think his fax of yes. signature. Yes, that's the handwriting here. Yeah. And I, I've not been taken to that as to how that breaks down between original signatures and facsimile yes. signatures, but for current purposes it matters not. Uh, and so where there's no express instruction, one simply draws the inference because where the money pictures are, shows you must be responsible. And I'm, I'm coming to that. I'm but, so but sorry. No, that's I've nice. taken you out of your course. I, I, I was answering your honour's question about the methodology. Sure. The modus operandi. And uh, we were, the, the reason for the uh, exchange is that as we were addressing the Bijou Matthew emails and yes. of course yes, and then the third methodology was that of the payments appear. What is consistent across the board is where the payments are not made from Gibson Dunn's client account, yes. there is a payment instruction prepared for the bank. Yes. And that payment instruction has both Mr Matthew and Mr Haig's signature save for that 604,000 dirham payment. If you remember, that seems to be signed by a senior member, countersigned by a senior member of the board. Is that in fact the only invoice, concocted invoice, that is over the $50,000 limit? Are, are, are there others which are over the limit, but are in fact signed only by Yes. Mr. Hayden, Mr. Bijou. It is the only one which is significantly over the limit. It may be that there are, I wouldn't like to say for certain that there are some which are not slightly over the limit. So, you know, 51, 52,000. That, that was my impression. Yes. Uh, and, and there is only one. It's, it's interesting how many there are in the 40s. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Your Honour <laughs> sees the point. <laughs> um, and those payment instructions in each case identify the payee as the supplier whose identity has been hijacked, but give Mr. Hague's bank account. Yeah. Universally. Yes. And Mr. Patel confirmed um, that until recently, and in some cases even today, banks look at the IBAN number rather than the name. Uh, but I think it is rare today. It is such a well, I think so. client's weakness. Uh, I think, and I think today the technology is, is simply a matter of the technology existing to be able to check the characters in the name beneficially against the characters in the name of the account. Because holder. it's all done electronically yes. without and personal. Yes, I think that's what caused it, if I, if I was caused to speculate. The days of bank clerks looking at cheques to ensure that they're right has been long since gone. Exactly so. Of course, so it does mean that the computer will say no more often, because if a letter is out of place, yes. <laughs> payment to Bodnar rather than Bodnar, <laughs> the system will reject it in a way that a bank clerk might not. <laughs> yes. But in any event, uh, we digress. The, uh, that is the point, that exactly how did the money end up in Mr. Haig's bank account? We cannot say for certain who created invoices in what context and how. But we can say for certain that the way the money ended up there, what caused the payments back to make the payment, 
It's the payment instruction in each case. Um, so that is the modus operandi. Yes, thank you. I don't propose to go through the banking evidence and the emails in every detail. Um, final preliminary matter, Mr. Patel was the only witness to give oral evidence. I hope that as the evidence unfolded, Your Honour feels that we were correct to serve hearsay notices with respect to the balance of our witnesses mm -hmm. and that the content of their affidavits and witness statements can be accepted on their face. Not least because they're predominantly simply producing documents and stating uh, obvious facts. Mr. Patel, I submit to Your Honour, uh, is, was an honest witness doing his best to assist the court and his evidence is credible and can be relied upon. Your Honour saw and heard him give his evidence over the course of a whole day. And indeed, Your Honour tested it in places. So I, I hope that Your Honour accepts Mr. Patel's uh, evidence. Uh, and it's not right to say that nothing was put to him. We, between court and myself, I think pretty much everything Mr. Hayne could properly have put was put. Um, so that leaves then the eight issues that I identified. Some of my submission can be dealt with extremely briefly. So firstly, has the receipt of funds by Mr. Hague been proven? Or has the receipt of the claimant's funds by Mr. Hague been proven? Uh, my submission, there's really no obvious, no, no serious challenge on that. Uh, the bank account received a little over 8.7 million dirhams, 50,000 pounds, a little over 2 million pounds. In many cases, the, the reference on Mr. Hague's email, uh, on Mr. Hague's HSBC to buy accounts even says GFH capital. The payment instructions were to Mr. to the, the claimant's bank account. The payment, in, the payment instructions were to the claimant's bank to be paid, uh, and there's a correlation. In my submission, it's clear beyond argument to the extent that Mr. Haig doesn't admit receipt expressly that he received the claimant's funds. Secondly, was he a fiduciary? Well, that's an admitted matter. I was going to say an admitted fact, but it's a question of fact and Yes, law. well, it's on the pleadings. So. It's on the pleadings. That's admitted. So we don't need to detain no. ourselves with that. Indeed. So the next question is whether he, as fiduciary, has put forward a satisfactory explanation for that receipt. That's trite law. I took you on to FHR Ventures, which is there's recent Supreme Court exposition of it. So while strictly Mr. Haig has put forward no evidence at all. He hasn't stated that he relies on any evidence, that he's failed to attend trial, he hasn't called any evidence. Um, as Your Honour pointed out, his amended defence and counterclaim bears a statement of truth, which is signed by him. And he has filed three witness statements. Um, we say that none of the additional statements filed by Mr. Haig in support of his appeal, uh, which are before the court, have, other than the most general and unparticularized bearing on the question of Mr. Haig's receipt of funds. Indeed, you know, may feel one of the curiosities of that evidence is that whilst both Mr. Raisi and Mr. Abdurrahmano seem able to remember in great detail precisely which suppliers Mr. Matthew was allegedly cutting and pasting uh, some four or five years after the event. Neither is able to remember either with any detail when they saw it or indeed what it was they overheard Mr. Haig being promised. Um, but such as he, such explanation as Mr. Haig has put forward in his defence, his amended defence, well, 
he hasn't pleaded to the GBW payments at all. He didn't shed them. Schedule one to my skeleton argument is a table reconciling payments and invoices to paragraphs in the pleadings and a, a one box summary of what Mr. Haig has to say with respect to each one. And Your Honour will see that he hasn't pleaded to GPW. Or at least not to anything other than those paid by Gibson Dunn. What, what does he plead in relation to Gibson Dunn payments to GPW? Uh, he pleads that it was a um, mistake, uh, uh, that it was a. Uh, um, if you're only a moment, I'll call up exactly what he says. Uh, uh, perhaps as well, rather than my try to remember, but to answer that question, it's divider 2A of volume 1. Yes. Um, and it, it begins with GPW on uh, paragraph 47 of his amended defence and counterclaim, which is page 96-21. And you want to see uh, paragraph 56. Uh, Mr. Haig admits to receipt of uh, uh, paragraph 50 and says that they were payments of, excuse me, uh, commission and alleged referral fees. That's 480,000 odd. Yes. He, uh, and th those are the. Um, the that, I'm going to say 480,000. Uh, paragraph 50 is the 65,000 and 245,000 emails. In fact, that was the attached invoice, please didn't need it. Um, paragraph 51 should be the balance. Um, paragraph 51 is the invoice for 480,000. Oh yes, no, you're right. It's, it's 480,000 Yes. But each of those are these um, Gibson Dunn. Yes, they're Gibson Dunn payments. Paragraph 51 are the internal GPW payments. Yes. A mistake doesn't plead to those at all. No, I've, I've noticed that. Um, as to the balance, Um, each of the explanations we say lacks particularity. None is supported by any alternative audit trail to the fraudulent or any alternative to the fraudulent audit trail in our records. And we submit that Your Honour can be quite satisfied that if such an alternative audit trail existed in Mr. Haig's records, because one bear in mind that one is talking about the receipt by Mr. Haig of funds into his bank account. Yes. So if he raised an alternative audit trial, he raised his own invoices and uh, bills and reconciliation forms and the like, one would have expected those to be inside his own records. His own records. If such an alternative audit trail existed, one might have expected that would be the first thing that would have been produced. Mr. Haig went through Baker and Mackenzie, Habib al uh, uh KBH Canoe, Stevenson Harwood, Middle East. So he was not short of competent lawyers in the first six months of these proceedings. He also had the assistance of two sets of leading counsel during the first half of during the second half of twenty fourteen. One of whom drafted his admitted before Sir David still he drafted his defence even though he didn't sign it. So it's not as if, and he managed to retain the services of PwC, so it's not as if he was short of advice as to what would be the best way to meet this claim. And tellingly, whilst document, internal audit documents find their way into the evidence, Mr. Haig's personal audit trail doesn't. It can be my solution. There is no alternative audit trail. Um, with respect to Lincoln Associates, 
In his original defence, and for your honour's note, the reference is uh, Volume 1, Tab 2A, pages 96-74 to 96-75, yeah. and it's paragraph 29, where he pleads to his receipt of the Lincoln Associate Papers. Um, his lack of particularity in his amended defence is to be contrasted with the particularity he felt able to give back in December 2014. His assertion that he received salary payments substantially in excess of those recorded on the face of his bank accounts was denied by terms, in terms by Mr. Patel. Is contradicted by the terms of his employment contract and is otherwise wholly unevidenced. Mr. Haig's assertion that he received substantial sums, uh, either as an advance payment or reimbursement of expenses, or it must have been hundreds of thousands, if not a million pounds, uh, was contradicted by Mr. Patel. Indeed, following a careful analysis of the claims records and Mr. Haig's expense accounts, Your Honour will recall that in fact some little over 500,000 US dollars is still due and owing on Mr. Haig's expenses. The, the exact figure was 583, was it? Something like that. Yeah. Can, can you give me the exact figure? Not necessarily now. Uh, yes, I can. It is given in Mr. Haig's third witness statement, uh, which Your Honour finds in Volume 2, Mr. Tab Patel. 17. Mr. Patel's third witness statement. Mr. Haig's, Mr. Patel's third witness statement, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, volume 2, Tab 17, and, this, and he deals with the expenses at um, page 739, paragraph 85. 5815069699, is that it? Yes. That's the one. Uh, and that doesn't take account of the fact that a number of the repayments he made, quote repayments he made, uh, were in fact monies obtained from the false invoice. I mean, there's no double counting there, is what I'm getting at. Yeah. You have on the one hand the false invoice yeah. and the money is going, and on the other hand you still have 581,000 that are owing by way of personal expenditure. Yes. Yes. That would, that's, that's the position on the evidence. Yes, thank you. Um, so on that basis, it's not right that Mr. Hay was receiving substantial sums into his bank account. They would then be reconciled later. Your Honour has no properly executed uh, referral agreement. In these proceedings, no sign, no document with a signature exists at all. It was only the version that appeared in the private prosecution that we showed Your Honour on Sunday with Miss Martel Welsh's signature uh, that exists. But there is no executed document in four years. Mr. Patel was very clear in his evidence that he found no evidence of such an agreement having been entered into. Your Honour observed it appeared the existence of such an agreement appears inconsistent with the share purchase agreement of Sport Capital. One may say, and I'm sure this was the first thing that occurred to Your Honour, within a month, within a couple of months of each other, it would appear that if Mr. Hayes' case be right, the claimant entered into a share purchase agreement and a referral agreement by which it promised to pay one of Mr. Haig's corporate vehicles a commission for selling shares to another of Mr. Haig's corporate vehicles. Very curious state of affairs. 
and you're going to recall he himself has put forward different schedules because the version of the referral agreement which had bore Miss Martel Welsh's signature had only a list of potential investors into Leeds United. The schedule provided by PwC that we looked at with Mr. Patel had a broad range of investments and potential investments and even failed investments. The Honourable will recall Mr. Hay claims to be entitled to a commission for the fa failed share purchase agreement with his own company. And finally, Your Honour will no doubt have borne in mind at the time when Mr. Hay claims to have been entitled, become entitled to these commission and referral. Uh, Can you just give me the cross references to the documents? where I find those two different schedules. Uh, yes, the first schedule Your Honour finds in the additional document we handed up, which yes. came from Mr Hay. And if Your Honour gives me a moment, I will find the additional PwC uh, reference. Additional, the, the one which was exhibited to Mr. Hague's uh, witness statements, and which was produced and appended to a PWC report. It was right, so that's quite early on. It's quite early on, but it's appended to Mr. It's part of Mr. Patel's exhibit, and I'm just double checking that the page, page reference is accurate. Yes, uh, it is volume three. Yeah. Page Yes. And, fi and, and finally, it regards the Commissioner Referral Agreement. It will not have been lost in your honour that Mr. Haig was at the time an employee of GFH Capital, the senior employee of that. It's not usual for employers to pay substantial commissions to the corporate vehicles of their employees, for their employees doing acting in the interests of the employer. It's inherently an unlikely arrangement which is unevidenced, and which Mr Patel said he found no evidence of even having been entered into. So far as the, what Mr Hague refers to as salary, Leeds United, and Mr. Hague, you know, Mr. Patel was candid with the court that um, GFH, Bahrain, did agree to meet Mr. Hague's per diem allowance. Or stipend. But whatever that sum was, it was nowhere approaching the million pounds plus paid to Mr. Hague, supported by the Fountain Court, Finos and attributed by Mr Hague to salary and expenses over the course of a few months at Leeds United. And Mr Patel said it was not usual to pay 
an additional salary when members of the fund were in post in, on the boards of in, in, an investment. That's fairly standard in uh, investment practice. But in this case, there was such a contract. Whatever that may be, it was not the liability of the, of the claimant itself. So it was not GFH Capital, it was GFH parent. GFH Capital's parent. What, what was the parent's name? Remind GF, me. GFH BSC, Gulf Finance House. And certainly it was nowhere even approaching the sums of money being siphoned out of the company by the Fountain Court invoices. So that can't be it. Um, and then correlations. Whilst Mr. Patel confirmed that Mr. Haig's receipt of funds simply couldn't be correlated with the incurring of expenses, according to his expense accounts. And it might be observed his time spent as managing director of Leeds United. There is a strong correlation between upticks in fraudulent activity and Mr. Haig meeting substantial expenses or making substantial payments. Your Honour will recall that uh, when he was had to repay a large amount in expenses, mm. there was a, an uptick in Lincoln Associates invoices that correlated with the amount he had to pay. And then finally, uh, Mr. Patel confirmed using his experience as a previous regulator, uh, the movement of money between accounts is itself indicative of fraud and somebody trying to conceal their origin. As Your Honour observed, the more sophisticated fraudsters will create shell companies with bank accounts in exotic locations where the money is moved between the, the, the accounts in the name of those various corporate entities. That Mr. Haig was moving accounts between, moving money between his own accounts for no apparent purpose. Doesn't mean that wasn't what he was trying to do if he wasn't sophisticated enough to create multiple corporate vehicles. So, in our submission, Mr. Haig has simply failed to put forward any credible evidence to support a legitimate explanation for his receipt of our funds. And the burden rested on him to do that. However, we can go one step further. The fourth issue, the fraudulent audit trail. There is no issue but that the audit trail is fraudulent. Indeed, it appears to be part of Mr. Haig's case that it is fraudulent. Um, yes. We submit nothing turns on the fact that the payment instructions were signed by Mr. Matthew for all the reasons that we've explored yes. already. Um, the next issue is, did Mr. whoever actually created the documents, were they created or procured by Mr. Haig? And we say, and so Mr. Haig was candid with the court, as we explored a few minutes ago, about the way the office operated. But, that said, um, there is the issue of the emails going to Gibson Dunn. Mm. Secondly, uh, the e emails get coming from Gibson Dunn chasing invoices. And your honourable report, those e emails were sent to Mr. Hayes' email account. And may well have been expected to be seen by him. If this was a hacked email, then when he saw that, he may well have said that one would have expected him to be he replied to Mr. Plumtree, well, what, what, what invoices, what payments, what are you talking about? Um, there is no evidence to support the assertion that the email was, a cap, was hacked. And in any event, there's no readily apparent reason for anyone within 
the claimant to hack into mis to abuse his email account. When I say hacking, that could be anything from a remote computer getting into the server and getting past his passcode and everything else through to Miss Edwards simply logging on and uh, using his password. That is technically hacking. But there's no evidence of anybody doing that and no reason why anybody would abuse his email account in order to, behind his back, give fraudulent instructions for payments to Mr. Hay. Yeah. Um, the Milnet payments were made to the account of a close friend of Mr. Hay. So whoever gave those instructions had access, not just to Mr. Uh, it's, uh, not just to an account, to Mr. Uchiyama's bank account details. And I'll pass on one way note that the Lincoln Associates payments went to accounts other than the one that was Mr. Hayes' salary. So somebody had access to those account details. The, G the Milnet, GPW, and um, Fountain Court payments were made to Mr. Hayes' cooperative bank account. So somebody had access to those bank account details too, in order to direct payment to him. Uh, the second and third of the payments to Mr. Utiyama, Mr. Haig himself describes as still, to this day, unrectified mistakes. Uh, it's a reasonable inference that at least some of the occasions, fraudulent invoices were created after the quantum of the payments had been decided upon or directed. Now, curious for somebody to independently decide to misattribute the payments that ended up in Mr. Hayek's bank account and then create a false audit trail to support them. We have a sharp correlation between the quantum of the fraudulent payments that were directed and the amount supplied by Mr. Hayek for specific purposes. In other words, the uptick in activity together with the substantial pay, uh, payments. Mr. Haig's claim that a conspiracy was hatched within the claimant to manufacture a false claim uh, and prevent him from whistleblowing on what he alleges are the nefarious activities of, this, of GFH Capital and its parent was denied by ter in terms by Mr. Patel. Um, but furthermore, Mr. Haig has put forward nothing to support the existence of such a conspiracy and indeed, where he has put forward evidence, whatever we may think of the evidence of Mr. Racy and Mr. Romanov on this side of the court, uh, even at its highest, it contradicts the suggestion of an ex post facto manufacturing of the audit trail to uh, bring a, to create a fraudulent claim. And we say there's no readily apparent reason for anyone inside the claimant to contemporaneously manufacture a false audit trail in circumstances where the claimant has agreed to make payments to its own employee, it's to be right. And finally, we submit the court is entitled to ask if a fraudulent audit trail covering payments by to the defendant was not procured by the defendant, leave aside who actually created it, but it was not procured by the defendant, then by whom was it procured? There's no readily apparent answer to that uh, forensic question. In the circumstances, we submit that it is at least more likely than not that Mr. Haig either created or procured the fraudulent audit trail which was found in uh, GFH Capital's records. So then I turn to the question of credit for 757,000 dirhams. And uh, Your Honour has just highlighted yet another point, that in fact there were other, that there were expenses payments of 220,000 dirhams and upwards, uh, which were met from fraudulent funds, money going in the circle. So he, re he repaid his debt to GFH with GFH's money. So one can add that to the sums I'm about to go to. Well, you can't add them. No, no. I mean, to the $500,000 that's due in uh, Yes, yes, yes. Right. <laughs> so in terms of how much, if any, credit Mr. Haig should be getting. Yes, yes. 
uh, one can uh, if you like one can deduct that immediately from the seven hundred fifty-seven thousand dirhams. Um, but we say, firstly, Mr. Haig has never raised this issue, even though for the first six months he had very competent lawyers, and even though this was part and parcel of our claim from the outset, see the particulars of claim. The, the Lincoln Associates were made, payments were made by, from Mr. Haig's personal bank account. So this point was never taken at any stage. The second point. Well, is that quite a fair way of putting it? Since the, if I can put it this way, the global defence that was put for yes. these or payments to which he was entitled by way of salary or expenses. I'm sure that those who drafted Mr. Hayes' original defence, um, would, and indeed those who assisted Mr. clearly assisted Mr. Hague in drafting the amended defence and counterclaim. Even I, were like, representing Mr. Hague, would say, "Well, it's, we did engage with the issue, and there was a suggestion that payments were made on behalf of the claimant." Yeah. Uh, so I'm sure an argument could be raised, but on, in the ultimate analysis. This is a very specific point. I, 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 don't, I, don't make, I, I don't say this point is a killer point. I simply say, well, uh, just point number one, Mr. Haig himself has never raised this issue in four years of litigation. And I think one can be confident that if the lawyers have been aware of this, they should, you have seen it referred to expressly, there's 757,000 yes. AED, which he's paid in legitimate invoices, uh, which is therefore a legitimate expense for you to repay. Yes. But if you look at it in the broader terms, where they're saying that everything is received um, as a result of the yes. forged invoices, this is in fact money to which he's entitled by where it's quite salary bonuses or expenses. Well, why address this in particular? It wouldn't. No. But I, I simply make that. I, I simply. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's Roman numeral one. That's my submission. Roman numeral two. Uh, the, the uncontradicted evidence is that 581,000 US dollars remains due and owing. In principle, um, we're entitled to offset any liability. We, uh, under the umbrella of liability, one can include any credit for legitimate payments made on our behalf. Uh, 757,000 AED is how much, did we say, in terms of dollars, give or take? Uh, I can tell. Your Honour, exactly, because it is point Roman numeral six. Oh, thank you. 207,000 year old US dollars. Okay, thank you. Divide by 3.65. Uh, your Honour will recall the Adira. The dollars is easy because Adira is picked. Yes, of course it is. Yes, yes of course it is. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, Mr. Patel said. To your honour, that a conscious decision was taken not to pursue a discrete claim with respect yeah. to the expenses for commercial proprietary uh, proportionality reasons. Um, I have provided to your honour Murad and Al Sarraj, mm. a, court, a case that may be subtitled Everything One Wished to Know About the Law of Fiduciary Liability, but were afraid to ask for fear of the length of Lady Justice Arden's answer. Um, it's from 2005, and for reasons I've never understood entirely, has not been uh, reported in one of the main law reports. The reason I refer you, Your Honour, to it is because uh, it considers the position of fiduciary, fiduciary liability. And in one sentence, what Lady Justice Arden concludes is that for encouraging this option, phrase uh, in paragraph 74 of the judgment. Um, the law imposes very strict rules on fiduciaries and even where a fiduciary is not acting fraudulently, if they make any profit from their fiduciary position, without the informed consent of their principle, 
they are liable to account for their, to their principal for that profit. Yeah. And the case is predominantly about the duty to account in the context of the claim for an account. Um, but the reason I also refer to it is that in, the, in this case, which was a hotel development, um, the purchase price included a £500,000 contribution from the fiduciary, Mr. Assange. And that was allowed in its entirety by the trial judge, but the Court of Appeal disallowed as a, cost, uh, as a contribution to the cost of acquisition. Which is, a, in, in some ways, what Your Honour is referring to, the credit for the expenses. But that was disallowed by the Court of Appeal in paragraph uh, 89-90 to the extent of £369,000, which, although would have had to have been paid somehow on the evidence by the claim was disallowed on the basis that £369,000 was in fact a secret profit by Mr. al -Saraj. So even though Mr. Al... Even though the claimant would have had to have paid out that money, Mr. al -Saraj wasn't entitled to any credit. Now, I refer to that by way of background, that of course this is a claim for breach of fiduciary duty. And although we plead damages in my submission, then, there is something tautologous in pre pleading first damages and then equitable compensation. Maybe yes, well, one ordinarily pleads always, <laughs> just in case there's a difference and it matters. Yes, just in case. Uh, but it's not, a, it's not fatal to the distinction. Um, um, the point is that in terms of discretion, one has that principle in the background that Mr. Hague is quite fiduciary, has strict liability for any profit that he makes. And so my Roman numeral five, Mr. Patel could st state in evidence that he could not find it, could conceive of no legitimate reason for Mr. Haig to be paying Lincoln Associates invoices, legitimate Lincoln Associates invoice, Associate invoices from his personal bank account. So we submit it's inequitable to afford Mr. Haig credit for what is really part and parcel of the fraudulent scheme. That he was taking care of the legitimate invoices while submitting much larger fraudulent ones. Uh, particularly, given that on the uncontradicted evidence, we have the entitlement to a $581,000 set-off against the $207,000 liability. So that's our route to Mr. Hay not being given credit for 57,000 dirhams and having been entitled to judgment for 8.7 million. But uh, the, the Al Saraj case is, is uh, somewhat off, isn't it? I'm looking simply at those paragraphs. It's a while since I last looked at it. Yes. <coughs> but uh, they did effectively give credit for part of the 500,000. Oh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> this deducted uh, uh, an element that was secret profit. Yes, and for example, had Mr. Hague put, had there been a joint venture, let us say, the um, the Monaco, had there been evidence that Mr. Hague put one hundred and fifty thousand pounds of his own legitimate money into Le Morne Cove, mm. then unquestionably the profit that arises from Le Morne Cove would have to be deducted by reference to £150,000 of his own money. Well, right. <laughs> and there is some case law about compensating the fiduciary for their skill and care. It doesn't arise in this case, but... Uh, there, but, but so in that, that way, absolutely. The question is whether 
as the fact that he used part of the fraudulently obtained money to meet expenses of paying the invoices actually raised by the supplier whose identity he'd hijacked is on, is on its face an un, unattractive case, we'd say. But, but um, I thought you, you submitted a moment ago that there was in fact no correlation as such. I'm sorry? I thought you'd submitted there was no correlation as such between the payment of expenses legitimate Lincoln invoices <coughs> as compared with the forged invoices. No, so there's no correlation between Mr. Haig's expense accounts. Right. Okay. So the, the airfares, yes. the credit card use and but, but does the evidence establish because I'm not sure that um, it does or it picked up the difference. <coughs> that the forged in and the obtaining of the larger sum was contemporaneous or broadly contemporaneous with Mr. Haig's payment of a lesser sum on a genuine uh, Your Honour finds the answer to that in my Schedule 2. Right. Uh, because it has on the left-hand side the payments in <coughs> and on the right hand side the payments out and your honour will remember we identified the payments to Lincoln Associates because there is the Lincoln Associates account number so remind me the first of them if your honour gives me a moment I will identify it I'm not on about page 6 Yes. Is it 185,000? Yes. So that was one. And then. And then they follow. 57, 52,000. At the foot of page six. And Your Honour sees 17th of September was the date of that payment. 16th of December, Mr. Haig received 425,000. Dirhams, apparently attributable to Lincoln Associates. Right. So let's just look at the one before that. 185,000 was on the 11th of September. He receives 475,000 on the 9th. Yes, I see. Yes, can you just take me to the other ones? Yes, I'm just uh, identifying them. Uh, yes, 8th of December. 8th of December. It is page 11th of the page. Hundred and twenty thousand dirhams. So I'm lagging behind. Hundred and twenty thousand, yeah. And in fact, 4th and 7th of December, he receives a total of 290,200 dirhams. Yeah. Attributable to... Well, one is, a, one is a global transfer. He receives 170,200 on the 4th of December, attributable to uh, Lincoln Associates. Yes, yes, 170,200 on the 4th, and then on the 8th he's paying out yes. 120. Yeah. Okay. So, how far have we got so far? 185, 52, yeah. 120, yeah. 150,000 dirhams, page 15 of 15, 5th of March of 2014. Yeah. And on the same day, 300,000 dirhams is deposited. The GFH, the Lincoln Associates invoices, the last of them, was the 13th of January. 152,000 dirhams. Um, in fact, in the particulars of claim, that gives me one moment. Yes. Um, 
we missed one, 19th of October. And it's in the particulars of Cain, isn't it? Yes. Um, sorry, I failed to pick that up. Paragraph 11, uh, second page of the amended particulars. say that it's perhaps remarkable that nobody has pleaded to this point before. The two, two lots of 100,000 that we failed to pick up, I think, in, the, in your schedule too, but they're not there, no doubt. 19th of October and 19th of November, I'm just looking. Uh, yes, the 19th of November one finds on, the, on page 9. Yes, I've marked it. And immediately before that, 18th, 16th and 16th and 18th of November, yeah. payments totaling 458,000 dirhams. Yes. Uh, and then the 19th of October, no, 19th of October, I appear not to have picked. I don't think you've got that. No, up. I don't think I picked that one up. Um, but be that as it may. Uh, but the figures in your paragraph 11 total the figure you've given me or not? Should do. I'll just double check the arithmetic. 185, 52, 150. 300, 500, 620, 620, 700, 800, 700. Might be 875. I think that's what I've just got to. Yeah. But of course, the important point is this. If we're entitled in principle to a set and there's any question of discretion. Do you, do you make it 857? Yes. Uh, uh, if there's any question of discretion um, about whether we should be entitled to exercise that set off, even at 875, we're nowhere near to $580,000. 857? Right. It, it, it's, no, I'm with you. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Eight five seven is nowhere near. Nowhere near five hundred thousand. No, 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 no. And so that is why I. Just rather get figures right. Well, that, that's that's certainly a pretty good case. Yes. But for all the reasons that uh, I. Have set out, we submit that Mr. Hay shouldn't be entitled to credit for 757,000 dirhams against money he stole for paying out the legitimate invoices raised by a, high, a supplier whose identity he hijacked in order to continue his fraud. Yeah. Yeah. Whilst it whilst in, as a, whilst a fiduciary, so breaching fiduciary duties. Um, that then brings us to the seventh issue, which is the wider allegations about GFH Capital and its parent. Now, the allegations against GFH Bahrain are denied in terms by Mr. Sani. 
Mr. Patel denied the allegations against GFH and, so far as he was aware, against GFH Bahrain, and he worked for both in his evidence. Yes. So Your Honour has an evidential foundation, it has an evidential basis to say there is a dispute. But um, Mr. Patel identified to Your Honour, in answer to Your Honour's questions at the end of his evidence, the status of GFH Bahrain as a Tier 2 registered entity. Yes. The status of GFH Bahrain as one of the larger financial institutions in Bahrain, uh, as he described it, a wholesale deposit taking institution. He set out for Your Honour the close regulatory scrutiny to which both have been subject for different reasons. Indeed, following the revelation of Mr. Haig's conduct, he said he called in the DFSA, who inspected GFH Capital very closely. So there is, he essentially identified the near impossibility of the sort of conduct Mr. Haig alleges not having been picked up by one or both of the regulators during their inspections. The allegations have absolutely no relevance to any issues in the case, and it's been explored. Uh, Mr. Haig's case is that the claim has been manufactured to prevent him making reports to the authorities. He doesn't say that what he alleges, excuse me, the claim that his parents have been up to, in some way justifies his receipt of the funds. In some respect, it doesn't really matter whether it's true or not. If, if his case be right, then what the claim was trying to do was to prevent him make, making a report to the authorities. But really, this, really the, the most important point is it's completely unevidenced. Mr. Haig has made serious allegations against both the claimant and a non-party to the proceedings, because GFH's parent is not in fact a party to the proceedings. Uh, publicly, but when the time has, and Your Honour gave him permission to put forward those allegations, but when the time has come to make them good, he has not put forward a single sheet of paper or a single word of evidence to make his allegations good. We say they are unevidenced, irrelevant and incredible. If one applies the re-age test Systematic fraud on investors, sanctions busting, and um, regulatory violations are inherently less likely than of internal laxity and a couple of individuals taking advantage, one of whom was Mr. Haig. Insofar as Mr. Haig says the office of GFH Capital was not run as well as it could be, well, Mr. Patel said the same thing to Your Honour. Of course, the important point there is that that was under Mr. Haig's watch. He seems to be suggesting that the claimant is at fault because whilst Deputy CEO, he oversaw an office which had lax procedures. Well, it is his pleading. It seems to make out that Mr. Al Reyes took over. Oh. Whilst he was presumably on this theory and the UK, but that seems to be the uh, yes. way in which he's putting the point in uh, paragraph 17. Yes, but it's still his watch. The claim to gauge the regular practices, false invoicing, false counting, late 2012 2014, which coincided with the responsibility of the management of the claims being placed in the hands of Mr. Alred. So that's, that's the line he's adopted. Um, but, but Ziora has the point. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that then leaves Mr. Haig's counterclaim.
Well, it's more than a point of procedure to say Mr. Haig has uh, failed to attend trial and has failed to move his counterclaim. The, the, the least that one can do if one wishes judgment for £4.8 million pounds is turn up. The second thing, uh, but that in itself would be sufficient to merit dismissing the whole claim, but we go one step further. Um, he hasn't filed any evidence to support the claim. He hasn't filed anything in respect to the commission fee and referral fee agreement. Um, what there is before the court, as we've already explored, is at best unreliable, you say. Second, there is a contradiction at the heart of the counterclaim. Because if his defence is well founded, then at least a substantial proportion of the money attributable to fraudulent invoices must have been paid pursuant to this alleged commission and referral arrangement. Which means that they can't be deducted by way of, or they can't be claimed again by way of counterclaim. If the sums remain outstanding, the whole 4.8 million, which appears to be Mr. Haig's counterclaim, then it must follow that his explanation for the receipt of the money which he attributes to that commission or referral fee is false. Uh, well, I'll explain, we've explored already, it's inherently unlikely that an employer would enter into an agreement with an employee that a commercial vehicle for that employee would be paid substantial remuneration for work done in connection with that employment. The existence of the Seven Dash Agreement appears inconsistent with the contemporaneous SPA. Do you want to observe? Now there is a claim for unpaid end of work benefits. Again, it's not moved, it's not supported by any evidence. Um, we say that there is a, a shortcut to exploring the employment laws of the DIFC and the correlation with Mr. Haig's exact um, employment contract and his uh, actions, which is it's a small sum of money. And we still have the $500,000 credit. But if he resigned, would he be entitled to it anyway? <laughs> There are some circumstances in which an employee who resigns is entitled to statutory end of work benefits. These aren't them. Well, constructive dismissal, but uh, for example, does it go wider than that? I, I, uh, it's a while since I looked at uh, no, um, the employment stuff, and that was all in the context of the yes. failure to pay and the fixed penalty that runs under Article 18 to or whatever it is. Yes. Well, I mean, Mr. Haig hasn't fully particularised his no. claim, he hasn't evidenced it and he hasn't moved it, so uh, I'm hesitant to right. start exploring okay. the employment laws of the DIFC and to see if Mr. Haig could have articulated a claim uh, which he hasn't chosen to move in, in circumstances which he hasn't evidenced. Yes. Uh, and then to see whether there's an answer to it. <laughs> it's, uh, because in any event, the amount he claims is offset. The, uh, finally, then there's the unpaid entitlement, he alleges unpaid entitlement under his contract of employment with uh, Leeds United. This is the alleged benefits which accrued um, if there is a change of ownership of Leeds United and he resigned or was dismissed as a result. Well, he has an evidence that his resignation from Leeds United was as a result of the change in ownership. That's point one. But more importantly, perhaps, the contract is with Leeds United. It may be that Mr. Patel said that as a matter of practice DFH Bahrain agreed to pick up some of the tab 
uh, back in 2013. But today in 2018, Mr. Haig has a contract with Leeds United to a claim against GFH Capital for alleged entitlements under that contract. So we submit that each part of Mr. Haig's counterclaim, quite apart from the fact that he hasn't turned up to ask for your judgment on it, uh, can be seen to fail. Uh, your Honour, I said I would be quite a lot shorter in closing than I have than I was in open. I hope that that assists Your Honour with the position of the claimant on this claim. I I don't think that Your Honour would be assisted by my repeating the laborious crawl, crawl through the banking evidence and the invoices, or by repeating Mr Patel's evidence, which Your Honour heard only yesterday. Unless I can assist Your Honour with a particular moment, Your Honour, excuse my class. So, so far as the claim is concerned, that is what I would say in closing. Unless I can assist you, Your Honour, further. I am informed that we've had a communication from Mr. Haig. Uh, perhaps it would be appropriate that Your Honour rise for 10 15 minutes, we can get it printed, we can all read it. And when I say from Mr. Haig, it's from Mr. Haig. I understand from Ms. Cook, it's from his email box, but says it's from somebody And it, has it been copied to the court or not? So far as yeah, 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 yeah. it's associate. Okay. So perhaps if you want to rise in 15 minutes, we, will, we can all assimilate it. And yes, see. all right. Yes, thank you. Very good. All rise. to Mr. Haig's communications by way of housekeeping. Uh, Ms. Cook has corrected the typo in the chronology. Thank you. I can hand up a hard copy. An electronic version has been sent to the court along with a word version of my skeleton. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so what, it is the same document you've yes. already seen with yes, yes, additions yes. at the end. Uh, so, Your Honour, th this is addressed to the court. Um, it's not. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, So Your Honour has an opportunity to read this new email. Um, paragraphs 1 and 2 simply repeat the assertions about Mr Haig's hospitalisation. Uh, Your Honour has observed on that. So far as Mr Haig being incommunicado is concerned, does Your Honour have what it says has been in hospital since Saturday? Yes. On the second page. Yes, sir. In the context where his witness statements referred to communication in it, which I took to be intended to refer to communication from the doctor, and saying he wouldn't be in hospital till after the weekend. Well, he could, he said his treatment couldn't start after the weekend. That, uh, is that right? I'm and uh, he could check, however, he could check in. Oh, is that right? Well, right. And I used, so that, I used the words check in. Yes, absolutely. Advisedly. Perhaps though, before that, uh, so far as Mr. Haig being incommunicado is concerned, 
So if you want to have Miss Cook's witness statement this morning, I do. If you want to uh, essentially just turn over the clip to the final page, just just the very back page, and no, uh, they're not double the attachments. Page. Yes, they're double double sided. So simply, if you want to simply turn it over. Of the attachments. Or yes, of the attachments. And if you want to go to the next page, keep going. Yeah. And again. Um, this is an email that Miss Cook received yesterday from Mr. Hay, timed at 08.32, so that must be the UK time, so it will be 11.32, in which um, his response is, I know, but telling me to watch it in the TV. What's he responding to? He's responding to Miss Cook informing him that his first attempt to derail proceedings yesterday had failed. Huh. <laughs> you want to see it's an email sent at 2nd of July 0804, that would be 1104. So if you're on a recall, so ten, between 9.45 and 10.45 yesterday morning, we were dealing with Mr. Haig's 52-page application, and Your Honour was dismissing it. And Your Honour commented that... Uh, he might even now uh, be watching it on... Yes. <coughs> on, the, on the live feed. Live feed, I think I said to all yes. to that effect. I yes. And the, res and the response, in the first person, I know they're telling me to watch it on the TV. Um, Oh, and, there's also, and there is also a post on Mr. Haig's Instagram account today. I was trying to solicit the details of it. Um, so, what we have is a lot of assertion in this email that he is unwell and there will be medical evidence. And a lot of evidence in Mr. Haig's own name that he is far from incommunicado. Um, the paragraph four says, none of the emails the court is sending are getting to David, nor those of the others. In other words, we can send anything we like, but Mr. Haig will continue to deny receipt. Well, it's a matter for Mr. Haig. Um, then it says, David has been, paragraph six, this is perhaps important, David has been working on the statements for adjournment strikeout for a while. The court seeming to suggest that because it was dated the 30th, it was written as quite silly. Also, the court would be aware it has an electronic signature on it. The same signature on all views and all of his statements, mostly. <laughs> now, I mean, if that is true, then it's a revelation which may impact on the, the exchange between Your Honour and myself about the creation of fraudulent documents. <laughs> But, I mean, he now seems to be denying that he had any involvement in actually completing his own witness statement. Um, I don't uh, read it as being that, but, but uh, I think all he's saying is that it was worked on before and the electronic signature was put on last yeah, year. But then, that is exactly what he's saying, but the signature is the bit that turns it from a document into a witness statement. Yes. Uh, and also, if he has been working on his statements, since before the 30th of June. It rather puts his behaviour last Thursday and then throughout this trial into a different context. He was always going to make this application and he always wanted to make it on the morning of the trial. Yes, yeah, uh, that would be all of the peace with the past absolutely. experience. Absolutely. And then finally, the last two paragraphs. Um, well, we don't know whether Mr. Haig has made any applications for permission to appeal either the orders of Sir Andrew Smith or Mr. Justice Bryan. We haven't been served with any. Uh, Mr. Justice Smith, he attempted to appeal before Mr. Justice Bryan in April. That was one of the applications declared totally without merit. Um, and it's not beyond the realms of possibility that realising this trial is going ahead, he and his team have attempted to file some sort of application for permission to appeal uh, in the English courts in the last few days. That was certainly how he approached the enforcement claim. On being notified that it was happening, he started to prepare an appeal to this court against uh, uh, Justice Richard Charles' judgment. 
Um, but anyway, in any event, the court's directions have been quite clear that applications and appeals related to the release of funds run in parallel to the trial time table. Uh, then paragraph 9, should be, there should be an application in by David's former lawyers. Now, again, this is one of those Delphic statements which we have to deduce the content of. Um, we suspect that what is being referred to is a putative application by Keystone, which reared its head a couple of weeks ago, having previously reared its head shortly in advance of the 11th of April hearing before Mr Justice Bryan. That there is £175,000 sitting, and you honour to see Sir Andrew Smith's judgment, £175,000 sitting in a Keystone yes. law account, and indeed Mr Justice Bryan's judgment. Mm. It's not in terms subject to the proprietary freeze, but it is subject to the proprietary claim. Yeah. And Keystone were denied the comfort of being able to pay it away without fear of a claim by us. Uh, one approach has been for Keystone to seek into plead a relief with respect to that money. To which our response is, if you don't wish to hold it anymore, pay it into court. Yes. And we have put Keystone on notice that we will have something to say on the question of court costs if instead of paying it into court, they make some sort of interpleader of the claim. Um, we suspect that that is what Mr. Hague is referring to in paragraph 9. So it, it doesn't matter if... There's no concern to this court, is it? No. <laughs> no, we say no. I, I think what is being suggested is that Mr. Hague is in hospital for a month and that there are proceedings on foot in London which will release substantial funds so that he can pay lawyers and present a defence. Yes. Which, frankly, is exactly the same position as obtained since about September 2015. Certainly since September 2016. Uh, so we say that there's nothing here that should cause your honour to abort this trial at the very last moment. But it is entirely of a piece, Mr. Well, Hague. There's no application made for that. And there's there? no application made. And one way of reading this is simply uh, an expression of frustration by Mr. Hague and those around him that the court isn't finding in Mr. Hague's favour. Yes, well, uh, I, I read it as uh, a complaint. Uh, and it appeared to me subject to any submissions you wish to make, that the court's response would be simply to say that the court has made its decisions and as indicated in the past, does not comment on them for all the reasons for them. I wouldn't seek to dissuade you, Your Honour. Uh, and, uh, and to say that the hearing has now closed. Yes. And I, the court well, intends to proceed to judgment. Yes. I, I wouldn't seek to dissuade Your Honour from that. Indeed, I would respectfully submit that um, having indulged Mr. Haig on Sunday, having urged Your Honour to indulge Mr. Haig on Sunday, one must not give the impression that the court will indulge him if he continues to send emails or procure others to send emails to the court. Absolutely quite the contrary. So, yes, I wouldn't seek to dissuade Your Honour from that course at all. Well, that seems to me to be the right course to, 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 to say that too. Uh, and uh, as I say, the, the hearing has now come to an end. Yes. Um, what I was proposing to do, Mr. Bogner, was to um, go away and apply the judgment yes. and uh, provisionally to fix 12 o'clock tomorrow uh, 12 as time when I would. Give judgment. Yes. I anticipate giving an oral judgment. Yes. Uh, but it will be in, in, in the, the, the written form should follow shortly thereafter, because in practice I will repeat something in writing for delivering it on a basis. 
uh, it is conceivable that I might not be ready at midday and it might have to be two. But if you can keep in touch with the court of course. tomorrow, and I'm less told otherwise, work on the basis of judgment at midday. Of course. Uh, that's, um, I hope, will give me enough time to put my thoughts in order. Uh, any, anything else at this stage? Unless I can assist you, I can play the room. I don't think so, thank you very much. Uh, I suppose the only question that arises is uh, in, in the event of further communications between uh, now and the giving of judgment, yes. should there be any from uh, Mr. Uh, Hay, my inclination, unless there uh, was something that you felt necessary to raise, uh, with the court uh, is that anything that does come in should simply await the reconvening of the court at midday or two o'clock as the case may be. Yes. So it would only be if you saw some reason for the court reconvening for that in relation to any communication that the court would do that or indeed should I see seeks. something think it necessary. Yes. Would you like to see them back on that? Of course, uh, we're only around the corner, so uh, we can... You're, you're all in local hotel. Right. So uh, we can all reconvene. And the court has your contact numbers and so on and so forth, so that... And, uh, we, we will ensure that... If it was necessary yes, we can to meet a short notice here, it could be done. Yes. All right. Very good, thank you. Thank you all very much. Did you think any further about the terms of the order? Um, um, you don't need to decide that I, now. I did, and Your Honour is with respect correct. My initial reaction is it should be received by the defendant or for his uh, benefit. That's how you'd like to do I, I think that's a better way to... Very good. Perhaps his direct or indirect benefit is the best way. Your Honour... Well, you could think further about that. Uh, yes. Uh, Your Honour appreciates. My, my concern is we're asking for a declaration that property is held, was held on constructive trust. Yes. But really, Your Honour is asking how do we... Well, perhaps the simplest way would be, was held by, uh, I, can't, uh, I, was, I would suggest the simplest way, it was held by Mr. Hay or Mr. Utiyama, constructive trust, but Mr. Utiyama is not a party. Uh, and I wouldn't want there to be problems hereafter uh, and to add, end up with a further party to proceedings in any other jurisdiction. I, I will think some more, but that, that is really what Your Honour has in mind, what is the form of words that would capture funds paid to Mr. Utiyama, paid to the right of Dyke Frank, uh, but which were the property of the claimant. And as between Mr. Utiyama and uh, Mr. Hayden, yes, were... Uh, were used by Mr. Utiyama for their purposes. Well, the, the two elements, that there's one what's used by him, but there's two um, what is in fact um, who has the higher equity between the two of them, so to speak? You see. Well, this is, the, this is why I use the word for his benefit. Yes. Well, have a further think about yes. how the matter should be addressed. And, and I say there may be a necessity to draw a distinction between. Um, different bits of the funds that were paid into those accounts, but uh, Your Honor, if you'd like to consider that. Yes, uh, Your Honour doesn't need to be addressed on whether any funds received by Mr. Utiyama were received for Mr. to Mr. Hague's order for his benefit. There's no question that it was received to his order. I mean, he, you know, yes. that's where he asked them to be sent. Yes. Uh, so there's no difficulty about no. that. But in the context of constructive trust... So that's the point. And um, proprietary remedy, one needs to think quite carefully about what 
is appropriate and what isn't. Yes, and the que- really the question is, Your Honour, satisfied that it was trust property when it was paid to Mr. Rutiyar? And if so, on what basis? Indeed. Well, I think the inference is entirely clear in relation to the funds that come back to Mr. Hague. No difficulty. Yes. The problem arises in relation to to the balance. The balance that which goes to KFR and the little bits and pieces that Mr. Putiyama uses for household expenditure or whatever it is. Um, in so far as they're sharing the house. Yes. Um, there may be inferences to be drawn, I don't know. Well I I would submit to you that there is absolutely no evidence to suggest Mr. Utiyama had any reason to be receiving the claim as my that, that, that I understand. <laughs> the question then might be whether a fiduciary can avoid his liability by directing payment to a third party rather than to himself. So even if Mr. Utiyama was using it for his own purposes, well, I, again, that may be a question of duty to account on the one hand and proprietary remedy on the other, the two yes. not necessarily being, being the same, yes. being the same uh, as I'm sure you're conscious from... Well, I should say this, we don't seek a proprietary remedy over anything in the hands of Mr. Utiyama. No. From this court? No. No, no, I understand. But in, 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 the, in, the, in the UK either, we haven't joined Mr. Utiyama, we're not no, going to right. pursue him for £57,000. Uh, so, it, it, perhaps in that context, it may not be necessary um, to seek a, a precise proprietary route against Mr. Utiyama for that money. And we can't trace it into any other asset. So. Well, consider further. Yes, I think I should consider further. Form right to you to, yes. It can be addressed tomorrow if yes. needed. Thank you very much. Uh, midday tomorrow, unless you hear otherwise, please. Thank you very much. All rise.